Hello and welcome to the 2020 Virtual Bridegroom's Banquet. My name is Mother Gabriella. I'm one of the Stavrofor nuns of Christ the Bridegroom Monastery, and I'm just here to welcome you this evening to our event. We're so grateful that you could be here with us and that you could join us for this evening. And we're sorry that it can't be in person, that we could be together and, and hug and enjoy one another's company, but we're glad that you were able to join us regardless. Uh, I'd just like to share a little bit about what this evening is going to look like before I turn it over to our Master of Ceremonies. Um, just to give you an idea, we'll be walking through first an invocation uh, to just ask Jesus to be with us during this evening. Uh, and then we're going to transition to a video that has been prepared uh, about supporting spiritual fatherhood, which is our theme for this year. And then we'll be talking a little bit about how our money was used for, from last year's fundraiser and a little bit about what we hope to use with the funds uh, that will be provided this year for our needs and for the needs of those that we serve. Uh, and lastly, just a, a brief thank you for the, the great generosity uh, that, that you provide for us to make our life possible. So before I transition, I just wanna share a little bit about our Master of Ceremonies this year, Father Michael McCandless. He's the Vocation Director for the Diocese of Cleveland, a very dear friend of ours. Uh, and he'll be sharing with us also a little bit about his own journey with the monastery and, and, and some of his experiences with us. Um, he's been the vocation director for about 10 years with the Diocese of Cleveland. Uh, and we're just so grateful that he's able to be here with us this evening. Let's take a moment this evening and open our time in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Most Holy Trinity, remember the time at the wedding of Cana. So early within the relationship of the apostles and of you, Lord Jesus Christ. This time of community, this time in which you revealed yourself to your apostles and you began to bring a close brotherhood together with them. That same brotherhood has lasted throughout the church and exists, especially within the life of our religious. As we gather tonight, we have so frequently experienced the closeness, the hospitality, the bond that exists between those who love us within the church and those that we were able to share friendship with, and closeness in prayer, times of laughter, we ask tonight that you may bless all the sisters at Christ the Bridegroom Monastery. You may bless the monastery's presence within the eparchy of Parma, grateful that it is so close to so many of us here in the Diocese of Cleveland as well who share in the life of the sisters. Tonight, bless each of us who are joined together, even virtually, that you may help us to be at peace and share, to have times of great memory and times as well in which we bring forth generosity from our hearts uh, to respond to the lives of the sisters who put forth such a beautiful example to us in the church. As Cana was abundant with good celebration and close ties of friendship, may you make this evening full of the same. May you calm any anxieties, may you bless us, provide at all times, as you promised to, till the end of time. We ask all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, everyone. My name is Father Mike McCandless. I am happy to be with you this evening and very happy to serve you as your MC tonight. We are gonna start this next portion of our program with a video. And as you know, the sisters provide a video every year. This year is going to focus upon supporting spiritual fatherhood. And if you have been around the sisters, heard their stories, if you have been there when other people are visiting, I bet more than half the time you probably have seen a seminarian or a priest, somebody making a postinia. You've seen especially somebody who has come to be spiritually rejuvenated and I know for myself, uh, I find the monastery to be a place of great rest. So tonight, this video is gonna focus upon um, the wonderful interwovenness that our sisters have uh, with so many priests, priests from the Eparchy of Parma, priests from the Diocese of Cleveland, priests that are in other states uh, who come to visit readily, uh, with seminarians, with religious brothers, 
other religious who are of various uh, congregations and orders, and the, the ties that are built because of the sisters themselves and their love, how they outpour themselves in their femininity, their prayer, their liturgy, they tie so many people together. In fact, never have I seen a place outside of a parish or a cathedral within one of our dioceses or eparchies, a place that pulls so many visitors together that makes us feel so closely bound. And so tonight, this video will show uh, a few of those witnesses and a few of those people that have shared so much in the sisters' lives. I hope you enjoy. When I was in my late 20s and just wanted to know where God wanted me, and that was my place of respite. And knowing somehow Fayetokos would carry me from her arms, in a sense, and tangibly into to yours, uh, the sisters have been from the very beginning, uh, a call to me to remember not just who I thought I was as a priest, but a priest who's called to be a father, a spiritual father. O Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who are able to sympathize with our weaknesses and are completely without sin, Hear our humble prayers on behalf of your priests, deacons, and those studying for the priesthood and diaconate. Give them a deep faith, courageous hope, and a burning love for you, which will ever intensify in the course of their priestly lives. Through your grace, may they steadily grow in holiness and wisdom, and become partakers of your divine nature. May they never take for granted the gift of participation in your holy mysteries, and always be in awe before your true presence at your holy table. I think our relationship with priests is kind of like the relationship between Jesus and his mother. The priests are called to be out in the world, teaching and healing and providing the sacraments. And Mary was called uh, just as we are, to keep all of these things in our hearts and to point to Jesus. And I have a few priests who are close spiritual brothers, and we help each other to see this complementary aspect of our vocations because we're both called to both of these things. And so I think that simply by my being and my vocation, I help my brothers to remember that they're also called to a deep union with God. They need this foundation in order for their ministry to come out of something. <laughs> uh, they need to be able to, that foundation for the fruits of their life. Um, but then my spiritual brothers also help me by pulling me out of myself and helping me to remember to give myself in love and not to become too turned in on myself. It feels it it feels like a home that I didn't know existed. Um, that's that's a really good way to describe the monastery and kind of a, a home that um, my heart definitely ached for as a as a celibate person um, because we're supposed to have uh, feminine complementarity. We're supposed to have women in our lives and but um, it's so incredible because these women are doing the same things we're doing. We're, we're all trying to be in communion with God and united to the Lord. And uh, they live that very beautifully. And so they're an example um, of intimacy with the Lord. And yet, uh, um, I don't know, I, I, I feel like that intimacy with the Lord comes through in the way that they share their lives with me and anybody that I know who's ever gone out there. So... Everybody seems to have the same uh, feeling. I want to go back. Um, this is good. <laughs> it is good for us to be here, you know. Um, yeah, I feel like my priesthood would, would be way different without the sisters, without their presence, without their prayers. Uh, it feels. It just feels like support. It feels like it's real love. Um, it's it's been just such a a great gift to me personally and uh and I, I know I can speak just for any any other priest in seminary and I've ever known to go out there and and 
as less frequently as the, the sisters are and mothers are able to come out anywhere else, they just bring, it's like they, they bring the fire that's there and it sort of lights other people on fire. So I see it as a place like to, to be warmed up. So I was thinking about um, when I asked my confessor if he would be willing to be my confessor and his response to me was, I'll do it on one condition if you let me wash your feet. Uh, he didn't mean like literally with soap and water. He meant like, let me serve you. Let me take care of you. Um, don't be self-reliant. Let me be the one to take care of you. And that really moved me. And I started thinking about how much the priesthood is um, in the service of Christ and s as servant. And um, I was praying later with a passage in First Chronicles um, in chapter 9, where it's talking about the Levi one of the duties of the Levitical priesthood were the gatekeep. They were the gatekeepers. There were certain ones that were set apart for that duty. And as I was reading about it, it, I started thinking about my friend's ordination, which was coming up, and how they lodged around the house of God. They had to open the door. They had to keep watch over it and guard the treasures in the chambers of the house of God. And as I prayed about that, I realized that well, the kingdom of God is within us. And so really, I'm one of the treasures of the house of God. There's nothing, there's no greater treasure in the house of God than the human soul. And so um, this priestly duty is actually to keep watch and guard the house of God. And so in allowing the priest to do that, he's, that's really life-giving for him because he's living out the vocation that he was called by God to do. The first first uh, support from you as a nun is your prayer, your presence in, in God, and your your prayer life and your day fulfilled with with His presence. I think that this would need uh, what we need as a priest today in our park in all the world to support the ministry of priests for they proclaiming the gospel, proclaim the word of God in this world by your supporting. You know, this me means, you know, this behind, as you know, in army going to these fighters are going the first, but behind them they are, you know, they are keeping, you know, and maintaining, you know, all what is necessary. And this is what what I would expect from you as a as a from nuns and yes to and to live your monastic life faithful. That you know the priest will be inspired by you by your monastic life. So our relationships with spiritual fathers extends beyond the priesthood to encompass our relationships with our religious brothers, um, friars, oblates, monks, um, various kinds of consecrated men. This is a particular gift to me that gives me great joy um, because the works of mercy are deeply important to me, but the Lord's called me out of a more active life to the more contemplative hidden life of the monastery. Um, and so I can think of a, a handful of individuals that when I met them, it was like the father was particularly entrusting them to me as my brothers um, to support. But that support primarily takes the form of prayers, but also um, correspondence, companionship. And in turn, I'm just deeply encouraged to share in their active lives in the world, to have knowledge of how the father's pouring his life out into the world through them. Um, so my spiritual motherhood is complementing their spiritual fatherhood and vice versa. As a seminarian discerning the priesthood, I'm so blessed to have such a strong relationship with the nuns at Christ the Bridegroom Monastery. Although I still have quite a few years ahead of me in my own formation, uh, I already know that many graces and experiences I've had in my vocation up to this point can be attributed to the nuns. I'm so thankful and inspired by their incredible example of prayer, love, hospitality, uh, because it's these attributes that I hope I may bring into my own ministry one day, God willing, and through his grace, I might be able to spiritually nourish and care for my own brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the priests, when he came back from retreat, he told us that the priest on retreat had asked him, where was his Bethany? He said that, that priests need a Bethany, just as Jesus needed somewhere to go to visit Martha and Mary and and to have a place of retreat and rest and renewal. And 
He said his first thought was us, our monastery. And this is where he comes to, to be re-energized and to be able to go back out there and to, to give what the Lord has given him. I was very touched by that. And it's something that's come to prayer often because it's, it's a very mutually beneficial relationship. So yes, we are this place of rest and renewal, but, but just as Jesus's presence blessed Martha and Mary, so it is with the priests when they come to us, because we learn ideally to become a healthy and holy integration of Martha and Mary. We learn to serve and to love and to provide hospitality, but at the same time to, to receive and to, to rest in their presence and to try to aim to, unlike, unlike Martha, not be distracted by our hospitality and our work, but to be able to rest within it. And I'm reminded also of what Bishop Milan said, I think very wisely in, in a homily at one of the services at one of the, at the cathedral, he said, if we want holy priests and bishops, we need to pray for holy priests and bishops. And St. John Paul II said that monastics are meant to be a reference point for all baptized Christians. And so just as we dedicate our time and our prayer to helping the church to have holy priests and bishops, this is what we're all called to do. Every time I've been at the monastery, I've been slightly terrified because it's the terror you have when you trust and fear in the Lord that what's there, the ones that have been there and have chosen to, to love him and be loved by him the way you do, has made me dare to enter into such a, a dance with Jesus that I never thought a guy would do, let alone some father, some priest. But a dad would always dance with his, his bride. And uh, it's called me to be less reliant on me and much more on the Father's heart. And I think the sisters, the, the very grounds there have made me realize the very nervous part of what it means to be a father, which means you trust in God, you trust in the Father, you, and you love like the Son, the bridegroom, and, and you breathe every breath of the Holy Spirit to get through it. And then hopefully at the end of the day, they remember um, that you tried to love them the best you know how. And in that, I'm able to be here in a way that I never thought I would. So thank you. I've loved every bit of bre every breath of Christ the Bridegroom. As spiritual mothers, we uphold the spiritual fatherhood of the church, universally through our prayer and fasting, but also in particular through our relationships. I was reading recently in a book that was lamenting in the Western world how we don't have more spiritual fathers. And I thought it was really interesting how the author talked about the fact that it's actually the spiritual son that makes the spiritual father. And as I was reading that, I was thinking about how there was a priest that I met for spiritual direction with for a very long time who, who spoke exactly of that to me. He said that the trust that I had in him really elicited his spiritual fatherhood and really helped him to experience and to live that fatherhood in his priesthood. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, that it's really the approach of the son or the daughter towards the father that brings that out in them. I find it also true in my relationships with my spiritual brothers and my spiritual sons, that the more that I'm deeply rooted in my identity uh, as a daughter, but then also as a sister, a friend, or as a spiritual mother, I can approach them and I can love them and elicit that same familiar response that allows them to, to take me into their heart and to love me and to love the church better uh, and not be afraid as Joseph was, uh, or I should say, as the angel said to Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary into your home. They're also, they become unafraid to take me into their hearts and the church as well. In the beginning of the monastery, when we were discerning how God wanted us to live our prayer and hospitality, those are two fundamental aspects of monasticism. Um, we moved into the monastery at, um, in April of 2009 and just happened to be the same year that Pope Emeritus Benedict the 16th had proclaimed 2009 as the year of the priest. So in our discernment, we took a step back and, and looked at the, the situation in the church, in particular on the clergy, and we, um, it was clear that there were some priests who needed a, a well-deserved rest, and then there were others who needed to be revitalized. So what we decided was that on Wednesdays and Fridays, we would fast and pray for the priest, and we composed a prayer 
to pray for the priest by name. And so it was for priests and deacons, those studying for the priesthood and the diaconate. And um, even after the year of the priest, we continue to pray and fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. And the list keeps growing. I think the last number was 465 names. But we also incorporated into our Tipicon the relationship between the clergy and the nuns. And it's stated, a crucial part of the nuns' communion with the church is their spiritual sisterhood with their brother priests, deacons, seminarians, and monks, especially in the eparchy of Parma. Holy familial relationships within the church give meaning to the lives of the nuns. They will support these brothers in Christ to make use of the guest houses, providing them with an opportunity to renew their spirits and further encounter Christ as their bridegroom. The beautiful and life-giving relationships that have fostered through the years with the priests and the nuns has been a beautiful and precious gift, and we're very grateful to God for the blessing that they are to us. I remember when I was introduced to the sisters at Christ the Bridegroom by a brother priest in the Diocese of Cleveland. And one of the things that I immediately noticed about this priest's life and his demeanor when he described these nuns that he had gotten to know out in Burton was I was immediately curious about the joy that this priest had. And this priest is typically uh, light-hearted, he's funny, he brings about community wherever he goes, but his ability to get my attention um, seemed to come from the awe that he had experienced when he was around the sisters at Christ the Bridegroom. And that, that time, uh, when I finally made it over, not too long after that, um, I had seen when there was only even three sisters at the monastery, this tremendous hospitality, uh, this tremendous dedication to prayer, a way of life, vocation, service to the church. But the joy that he had communicated to me, so much of it being nonverbal, it was just felt from his heart, uh, the excitement, the, the light in his eyes, uh, really kind of brought my heart to a great attentiveness. And so after having met the sisters, um, that relationship began to grow, began to expand. And, and I've learned something as a priest, that um, so many of the friendships that I've wanted to have as a priest throughout years of grade school or high school or beyond, I find that I may want a particular friendship or I may want to be part of a particular community. Um, God is the author of every one of my real and authentic friendships. And this friendship with the sisters, and now six of them, um, this friendship has been God's work. Um, as it is, I believe, for so many other people, again, priests, seminarians, religious men, um, beyond, certainly to married couples, religious women, single people. But God has brought this about. He has expanded everything. He's blessed it. He's grown it. Um, he's brought about the depth of conversation. So the joy that I felt became real for me because of God's goodness. One of the things that I notice, uh, and I could talk for a long time, but one of the things I noticed very keenly about all the sisters at Christ the Bridegroom is this. They bring forth feminine beauty into the church with a radicalness and a way that challenges because it's so authentic. So their radicalness in the way that they pray, the way that they love one another, the way they're dedicated to one another, the way that they're dedicated to their eparchy, the way that they're dedicated to visitors, could be a stranger, could be somebody that they've known for a long time. But the radicalness of their life, of their prayer, is so consistent. It has to come from a divine font. It's just so evident, right, that they're filled with someone, not something. So the radicalness of their life and their hospitality is evident. 
What I really, really appreciate and what has very much penetrated my own heart has been the radicalness and the effectiveness of their bringing beauty to the church. We don't understand or we don't often see a real penetrating femininity that just stops us in our tracks. And we need to see more of that. It is definitely the identity of the Blessed Mother. We see it in masculinity too. We need to see that. One that just stops creation, that stops us from doing the other things that we're doing. And it helps us to recognize that God is at work in this person. God is at work through these holy women because they just put forth a beauty that stops and helps us to notice the beauty of the church. Religious women are Mary in the flesh. Religious women bring forth the identity of Mother Church. Religious women bring forth that, that very efficacious, that like tangible moment of encountering God's love through his daughters, right? And the sisters do that. And it's one of those moments where, as a man, I think it results in a number of things, but I can think of a couple of things that I've seen in seminarians or I've seen within myself, other people. The first is this, nothing strikes a man's heart like a beautiful and righteous woman. So the Blessed Mother has the opportunity, she has the potential, the capability of just completely bringing Joseph into this new way of life. Right? Like, do not be afraid to take Mary into your home. And he does. And her beauty and goodness just brings him into the right response. So, so it is with religious women, and so it is with our sisters at the, at the monastery. Their beauty brings us into the right response. We, we're able to respond to them. We, ser we want to serve them. <laughs> we want to visit them. Uh, we want to rake the leaves in their yard. Uh, you know, we want to we be a part of their life at the monastery because there's so much goodness being generated. We want to respond to it. We want to be a part of it. We want to be able to be a part of that community that's taking place. John Paul has a beautiful line. He has a, a number of reflections. There's a reflection on givenness in which he writes, the man learns to have the right orbit around the beauty of the woman. And it's the, it's the sisters in my life that have taught me that. Um, they've been so instrumental in that. And so in my life, we see this, this beauty that radically interrupts us, stops us, gets us to notice God within them, it makes us as men respond because we're so drawn to what's authentic and what's beautiful, like really beautiful, um, and we're drawn to wanting to join in that creation, which goes back to what Adam did. He wanted to go seek the goodness of creation, and so these women bring about the attentiveness of our masculine hearts. I know so many priests um, so many seminarians, even after their first visit, they have the same awe and curiousness and joy that I had. And, and so you have this moment where when people keep having this similar and same response, you know, God is bringing about this fruit that we need in the church. You know, God's bringing about this response that uh, we need because it's, it's ordering us towards prayer. It's ordering us towards liturgy. It's ordering us towards a really good meal. It's ordering us towards like Cana or the moments of Bethany, which have been already mentioned tonight. You know, it brings us into the right relationships of community that Jesus Christ had. The last thing that I would share is this. I know in my life, I would not have had the challenges and I wouldn't have had the invitations but I wouldn't have had the accompaniment. I wouldn't have had the attentiveness to my heart and to my mind, even in the forms of a phone call or a short visit or maybe a letter. Um, the attentiveness to, to, to me that would have helped me be such a good priest, you know, um, or a better priest. And, and so in my life, it's one of those moments where I could only imagine that I would be poorer if I wouldn't have had this encounter with all of these sisters from the very start, which when I look back was, you know, a good six or seven solid years ago. And to watch what God has done since then has been a complete gift. So tonight, in my heart, as you've heard other people mention as well, 
Um, this is really a celebration and it's an, it's an acknowledgement of what God does when he builds community in the beauty of religious women who model the church with their prayer, their hospitality, the love that they have for their bishop and their eparchy and for each other. It brings and draws all of creation into the right response. And you know what? If, if we receive this invitation to, to have the right response to the church uh, because of these women, um, my desire is to only keep bringing people in contact with them uh, because I think people's hearts will be set aright. They'll be healed. They'll sense the Blessed Mother's own love and Joseph's own love. And uh, we will have a healthier, more full, and happier church uh, because of them. So as you know, we have a church that exists in time and space. Uh, brick and mortar, uh, siding, buildings, lawns that need cut. The funding that has taken place just from this last year's bridegroom banquet uh, has been used to directly help uh, for the working and the remodeling of the foundation of the chapel, really. So waterproofing on a structure that was first originally built in 1956 then added on to in the 60s has now been uh, waterproofed and worked on from the bottom. And the inside of the bottom, that foundation and basement, we have had to remove mold from the chapel basement. So those steps have been the primary use of the funds that were gathered for the bridegroom banquet in 2019. For this year's bridegroom banquet, 2020, the funds that will be gathered from tonight will be used for the interior of the chapel in the year ahead. So one of the major things that the sisters would like to improve is just working on the electric and the wiring of the chapel. Again, it's one of those projects that's kind of behind the scenes, but with the building that is as, uh, as old as it is, that needs to be upgraded. There'll be new bathrooms that'll be installed, and also there'll be an HVAC upgrade so that we have a chance to have some climate control within the chapel. If you've been inside there, and, and so many of us have been inside this chapel, right, when we've been invited on the property, this would be a great way to improve the hospitality and to improve the liturgical experience that we have there. In the time to come as well, it's one of those where the funds, as we use every year, will help to um, really supply the sisters with their work of hospitality, their work of prayer. It's the general life that our sisters have at the monastery. Uh, their prayer, their hospitality, their basic way of life, and feeding the hundreds of people that come every year, myself being one of them. Uh, that can probably rack up a pretty good food bill from the grocery store. So tonight's funds are going to be used not only for, again, some of these places that are behind the scenes, the foundation, the, the plant of the chapel, uh, but for their daily life, to allow them to remain um, as this beautiful community that puts forth femininity and maternity into the church. So as we get ready for that, We'll begin with our details uh, tonight for our donation giving. Tonight, we are so grateful that you've joined us for our Bridegroom Banquet 2020. Uh, you've heard a lot of beautiful witnesses, especially from a number of religious men, priests, seminarians that have uh, just received the love from our sisters at Christ the Bridegroom Monastery. Tonight, we are coming to the moment where we need to ask for your support. And I'd like to first mention that as we've been blessed in previous years at this banquet, uh, we have once again received the support of an anonymous donor who has said uh, that they would offer up to $100,000 matching pledge. Um, and for all of us, that just brings, I think, a lot of encouragement for us to be generous tonight, to know that our funds will be matched, especially up to that um, amount of money, which be a true blessing for the monastery and for the sisters who are there. So that'd be a, a really good thing to, to keep in mind as you make your donation tonight, that that pledge will be doubled up to $100,000. The other piece is this, know that every single uh, dollar that you give is going to go directly to the sisters and the running of the monastery. You know, once again, this plant needs to keep going. It's a house of prayer. It's a house of hospitality. Um, I know when people like myself come over, their food bill goes up that week, right? So it's one of those moments where hospitality is a beautiful thing, but it's, it does require the generosity of people like yourself. So we give to that because we want to see this beauty continue to move throughout the church, throughout the eparchy, especially locally here in this Cleveland area and this Parma area. So tonight, 
I encourage you to be generous with your gifts. Know that they'll be matched up until $100,000. Everything that you give is going to go to the life of the monastery. You know, tonight, I already have my pledge set to go uh, for the nuns, right? So it's important to be uh, just generous and ready. If you can give tonight, uh, we encourage you, follow the link that is uh, listed here uh, on this video, and it will take you to uh, an online giving page where you can offer an online gift uh, here this evening. Uh, if you'd like to give in the time to come, or you'd like to make a pledge of a gift that you'd like to give in the time to come, hit the second link that's listed in this video, and it will take you uh, once again to a place where you can make a pledge, and that will probably be on the online giving page uh, for Christ the Bridegroom Monastery, and it'll be marked for Bridegroom Banquet 2020. So many beautiful things come uh, because we live in a church that we're able to make great fruit and to generate great friendships uh, from the time that we have, from the experiences that we share. Everything that you give tonight, um, even your pure presence from joining us virtually, um, it will be a gift in return to the sisters who have given themselves over in their lives uh, to their vocations, uh, vocations that serve binding us together as a church. So um, as we always are each year, let's be generous to these sisters who provide so much from their hearts and from their whole selves. Thanks for being generous. Thanks for joining us tonight. And if you follow the directions, you can complete your donation here now. Thank you. Glory to Jesus Christ. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. These words from the lips of the Mother of God at the Visitation are an attempt for me to express our, our love and gratitude for all of you um, through the years of your faithful support, through prayer and, and finances. I wish that we could be together, so, you know, and me in particular, to squeal with delight and to hug and kiss you. Um, but because of the COVID issue, you know, obviously that's, it's not possible, but maybe it's better this way too, because it would probably kill all of us not to be able to do it, even though we were together. But I wanted to just express um, our love and gratitude to God and, and to you for, for everything that you've done for us through the last 11 years. And uh, just invite you to, to pray with us, to break bread with us and to be refreshed. And we also would like to thank all those who have been donating to the monastery through the course of this fundraiser and especially for those whose hearts have been moved this evening. We want to reassure you of our continued love and prayers. Glory to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.